what can we do to accelerate decarbonization? So that's the question that uh, is really at the top tonight. Fortuitously, tonight's guest speaker has an impressive set of credentials which make him uniquely qualified to answer this and many other questions, bringing us up to speed as to where we stand in the transition to a third industrial revolution. Dr. Jose Torre Bueno is a founder and the executive director of the Center for Community Energy. He is a green technology scientist and environmental advocate, an expert in battery technology photovoltaic systems, utility rates, and modeling energy demand, Dr. Torre Bueno has become a contributor to the development of community choice aggregation programs and has been meeting with local governments to educate and encourage them to buy into CCAs. With over a decade of working in green technology, he has extensive expertise in designing, optimizing, and building photovoltaic battery combined systems. Dr. Torre Bueno has been awarded 34 patents for his inventions and has a pending patent on using advanced mathematics to optimize the energy improvements up to a building. He has decades of experience in presenting complex technical information to audiences with all levels of expertise and has been a driver in groundbreaking product development for green technology and the biotech industries. Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's guest, Dr. Jose Torre Bueno. Well, thank you. It's, uh, so can I try to share my screen now? Please. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Desktop one, share. You should now all be seeing uh, my first slide. Are we seeing a slide? Looks great, yes. Okay, well then let's get started. As we said, this is about community choice aggregation and the path to clean energy and what do we do to make sure it goes smoothly. So for starters, there we go. I'm gonna start by a, a review in some technical depth of the electricity system as it exists. Because you have to understand that to understand where a CCA is gonna fit. So basically, from power plants, electricity comes out at some 10,000 something volts. It's typically stepped up to hundreds of thousands of volts to go on the high voltage transmission lines that you see crossing the countryside. And then it's stepped down again in these community substations that you see around your neighborhood to about something over 10,000 volts to be distributed on the poles that you see, or in some cases underground around neighborhoods. And then these cans that you see on poles are a small transformer that reduces it to 240 volts for delivery to a house. So first thing you might wonder is, what's with the transformers? Why is it necessary to boost it to hundreds of thousands of volts and then take it back down to basically the same voltage? The answer is that the capacity of a wire is proportional to the square of the voltage. So these wires that you see in a, in a long distance high voltage transmission tower, those aren't significantly bigger than your thumb, um, but they have 3 million times the capacity of a household wire uh, per unit cross-sectional area. So there's maybe a dozen of them on this tower here, and they're carrying as much energy as would power a city. Um, and similarly, these wires on the local distribution, which are so thin you can hardly see them in this picture, um, have about 300,000 times the capacity of your household wiring because they're running at 10,000 something volts. So there's good reasons for this, and it, but it is a source of a lot of trouble. Um, you've probably heard about all the problems they've had with fires being started by trees touching, not so much the high tension ones, which are so tall they're not giving you a problem, but the local distribution wires, um, if the trees grow up and touch these wires, they've got a problem. Just so you know, when you look at a pole, it's not the thick wire that you see here. That's actually telecommunications wire where the phone company has rented space on the pole. It's the very thin wires at the top of the pole that you have to be concerned about. They're carrying 13,000 volts. 
And that's the ones that the um, power company has to trim the trees back from or it'll cause a fire. So if you just a public service announcement, if you drive around and see the trees touching these lower <laughs> wires, you don't have to panic. But if you see the trees touching the upper wires, it means the power company isn't doing their job. Anyway, that's the, the basic structure of a electrical distribution system. The other thing you have to understand is who's regulating it and who's owning it. So power generation can belong to many different companies. It's regulated by various government agencies, both at the federal and state level, which determine whether it's needed and determine how much they can charge. Um, or in the case of the Air Resources Board, regulates their emissions. The transmission is regulated by both the state and the federal level. And the management of the transmission of power over the grid is managed from moment to moment by a quasi-governmental agency called the California Independent Systems Operator, CAISO. And they're very central in this issue of decarbonizing California. The local distribution is regulated by the California PUC, um, but it typically is a monopoly in any town. And then the load serving entity is the company that's actually selling you power. Once upon a time, many years ago, there were integrated utilities that would own all of this. They were broken up mm, decades ago. So now, even if a utility owns both a power plant and is a load serving entity, there are um, different divisions of that utility under a holding company that have those different roles. So moving on, let's talk about this, the consequence of this business that the utilities belong to, the different aspects of this belong to different companies. You see that reflected in a bill. This is what uh, is called a tiered bill. But if you look at it, here's a charge for electricity delivery. This is a, a big house. They use over 2,000 kilowatt hours in a month. They're paying $1,000 a month for their electric bill. But here's a charge for delivery. It's with $600 total. Here's a charge for generation, 300 something. So they paid more for the transmission than for the delivery. So conceptually, this went to one company and this went to another company, um, even though they might have actually been subsidiaries of the same holding company. And the other thing about this is that the, um, this is called a tiered bill because how much they paid depend on how much they used. The first 347 kilowatt hours, they got pretty cheap, but they used more than 2,000. So most of what they used, they paid a lot more for. In this case, the um, generation was all the same price. Their utilities are all switching to time of use bills. In a time of use bill, the delivery is the same price, but the usage, the generation, depends very strongly on when you do it. There's almost you know, five times difference between the electricity you use at night and the electricity you use in the evening. So following up this thought about it depends when you use it. This is a commercial bill. And this is a commercial bill for a big supermarket that has a big solar array. You can see that certain times of the day, they're actually a net producer of power. They're running the meter backwards. But they still have, despite the fact that they have a big enough solar array to make basically all the power they're using, they still have a, a bill over five, almost $5,000 a month. What's going on here is that a commercial customer pays a third charge called the demand charge. The demand charge is proportional to the fastest rate at which they used electricity at any time during the month. Even if it was only for 15 minutes in the whole month, they charge, you see this is kilowatts, not kilowatt hours, because that's the rate at which electricity is used. And based on the moment of highest demand, they get these very big charges, which in this case represents most of their bill. So why is it so significant to the utilities? Oh, the other thing you should know is that the bill is gonna keep going up. These are the requested rate hikes by the local utility for the next couple of years. Um, but 
let's look at this. This is two things superimposed. The blocks here are a utility chart of the rate at different times of day. This is the sum of the transportation, the, the transmission and the generation. So it shows that the kilowatt hours, a kilowatt hour of electricity can get up to 67 cents in the evening. This is from five to nine. And it's 36 cents in the middle of the night. And so why? What's so important about the time of day? Well, the superimposed on this is the wholesale cost of electricity at a particular transformer station in South San Diego on a particular day. And it varies enormously. In fact, this is actually the zero line. It actually went below zero very slightly in the middle of the day. And we'll get to why. And then in the evening, it shot up to way higher than the average. So this business about these, these time of use rates are an attempt to model the actual cost that the utility is, is encountering buying electricity in order to encourage people not to use it during the night and to use it during, and I'm sorry, not to use it in the evening, um, but to use it during the day or particularly at night. I don't know if any of you remember, they used to have a campaign Oh, you should run your washing machine and, and uh, pool pump at night. Um, <coughs> now, they're actually wanting people to do it during the day, and we'll see why in a moment. This is the graph from that agency, Kaiso, of the total usage of electricity in California over the course of a day. Um, this happens to be 614 of last year. Um, and it's very low or lower at night, and then rises in the morning and then has a peak in the evening hours. But, so what's the big deal with it? This is two graphs. This is the actual total demand, but this one in the blue is the net demand. That's demand exclusive of renewables. So this represents what all fossil fuel plants have to be doing. And the issue the state's facing is this business of the ramp. As the sun is setting, renewable energy becomes less available and it has to be made up somehow. And this is referred to as the duck curve. And you wonder where that weird term came from. Somebody looking at this curve and how it was changing over the years decided it looked like the back of a duck. And so the name stuck. So everybody who works in the utility industry is all concerned about the duck curve and how to mitigate the duck curve. And that really what they're getting at is this ramp in the evening when the requirement for non-solar energy rapidly rises is what they're referring to really by the duck curve. And this, so this is this, the, the flip side of that. This is actual generation. So this is color coded. This is again from Kaiso. This is color coded according to where it's coming from. The green is renewables. So during the night, there's a certain level of renewables. This basically represents windmills. Um, and then the sun comes up and the solar panels start producing power. And California has enough solar now to meet most of its energy needs during the day by solar. So what the Kaiser was doing, since they're managing this, is they're importing power from out of state during the night. And then during the day, those imports go down a lot. Um, Hydropower imports go down. This orange here is natural gas plants, which are running, go down. And then in the evening, they have to be ginned up again to meet this ramp. And oh, by the way, this line here, which is dead flat, never changes. That's the one nuclear power plant in California. One of the many disadvantages of nuclear power plants it's basically impossible to adjust their power. So even though there's much less need for power in the middle of the day and more need for power at night, a nuclear plant can't be adjusted. The other thing that the state's very interested in and wants to see a lot more of is batteries. At the moment, there's a, a mark here for batteries, but you can't even see it because this is the zero line. The batteries are like the noise that's making the zero line look not perfectly smooth because that's how small the total storage of batteries is at this moment. But that's something the state's looking to make much, much bigger. 
So moving on. So th there's another level of complexity here. I've been showing you the total power, but I mentioned the price of power at a particular transformer station. What Kaisa was actually having to manage is the dispatch of power to every transformer station in the state. Every one of these dots represents either a generator or a transformer station. And the color coding is what's the instantaneous price of electricity at the wholesale level to deliver it to each of these stations, which is gonna be different depending on how close it is to a generator, how much power is being drawn from each transformer station, and how big the wires are from the local generators to the transformer station. So the price of power is more or less uniform through much of California, but here we are in the Bay Area, they're having some kind of a problem, and the price of power is several times higher on the wholesale level than the average price in the rest of California. So Kaiso is not only managing the hour-to-hour the -hour shift in power, they're managing the delivery of power to every one of these stations. So there is actually a huge control room um, in Sacramento, I think, where a bunch of people are sitting in front of way too many computer screens, and they're running a, a automated bidding market. This was put in place after um, Enron gamed the system and, and caused blackouts and cheated everybody. Kaisa was invented in order to have a, um, a fair market for electricity. And so they're running a day ahead market where people can bid to want power, people meaning utilities, can bid that they want power or generate owners of generators can bid to deliver power on a given hour tomorrow. Then there's a 15 minute ahead market. And then since there's basically no capacity to store electricity, there's a at the moment settlement market. And the point is that these close-in markets can get way out of whack. If we go, I don't have that slide here. Um, it's possible for the, the momentary market to shoot way up, right? can go up to $1,000 a, a million kilowatt hours um, from you know, nothing to 40 or something. So the people who buy electricity for utilities, that is load serving entities, have to either have electricity on long-term contract or buy it in these markets. So the, there's a further complication. This is where it gets, this is really the most complicated slide and the most important one, because it has a lot to do with the ability to retire these natural gas plants. Kaiso's mission is to assure power availability. And in the days when, you know, there was a, limited number of giant plants that ran all the time because they had, you know, fuel pipes coming into them. In their minds, it was a pretty straightforward thing. Now there are hundreds of power plants, many of which are inherently intermittent because they're dependent on the, the wind or the sun. Um, and, but Kaiser was supposed to main sh make sure that there's enough power all the time. <clears throat> they've decided that the right way to do this is to require each load serving entity to have resource adequacy, by which they mean, <clears throat> in addition to wherever they're buying power, buying electricity, they have to have reserve capacity on contract. Even if those reserve plants aren't running, they have to have over and above whatever they're getting they have to have 115% of their anticipated maximum load on contract. So if they're getting it from a fossil fuel plant, that plant is considered to have 100% capacity because it can run all the time. But any other generator is given a qualified capacity, which is its nameplate capacity derated by a percentage called what they call the effective load carrying capacity. So they assign um, an effective load carrying capacity to every generator in the state. And solar and wind generators are, are given a lower effective load carrying capacity. And this is done by a very complicated model that they run, where essentially they have, a, they have a model of the whole state. And they have historic records of usage, and they have historic records of weather. So they, what they do is they run this model 
where they substitute for all renewable sources um, what they call perfect generators. And a perfect generator is one that runs all the time, anytime you need it. And then what they do is they run the model again and again, making the perfect generator smaller and smaller. And when they get to a level that has the same performance as the historical performance of the grid with renewable energy, they say, ah, see, if they had been perfect generators, they could have been this much smaller than the renewable generators. And therefore, the renewable <coughs> generator's effective load carrying capacity is whatever this percentage is that we reduce the, the quote, perfect generators to. So by that very complicated model, they assign an effective load carrying capacity to every generator. A consequence of that model is the more of a weather dependent source there is on the grid, the lower the effective capacity is for all generators of that type, which means that CCAs who are receiving power from solar plants because they want to be green have had the um, effective capacity of those solar plants retroactively reduced in the state's model and therefore have been forced to go out and buy what's called resource adequacy, that is essentially standby, from gas plants because the solar plants are considered to be less contributory to reliability. And to show how much that is, this is they do this, by the way, by month, because the weather changes by month. <clears throat> so this is from the California Energy, uh, actually the CPUC, the Energy Commission, um, graph of blue is what the um, percentage value of solar was um, a year ago, and gold is what they're going to make it this year. And you'll notice that we're, we're already below 50%. So even in the middle of summer, the solar plant was considered to provide less than 50% of the capacity relative to what it's actually generating. And what they're saying is it's going to get even lower. You'll notice in the winter, the solar plant, even if it's generating power, is considered to provide no reliability to the grid. So somebody who's getting power from a solar plant in the winter would have to have a plant of equal size on standby to meet their reliability requirement. And these fees are non-trivial. Um, an RA fee might be six to nine dollars per kilowatt per month. And remember that typically they buy power in megawatts. So a CCA that say had a hundred megawatt PV plant somewhere out in the desert that they were buying electricity from, over and above whatever they paid that plant for the actual electricity they got, they'd have to pay somebody else maybe $300,000 a month because um, in the summer their plant is derated about half to have um, a gas plant on standby. So this is one of the reasons that gas plants aren't being retired as quickly as you'd think, even if they're only running part of the time. And this is a very contentious issue before the PUC. A, a company that owns gas plants actually used the state's model and ran it out to 2050 when the state wants to be 100% renewable. And what their result was is they compute that even if the state was 100% renewable energy in 2050, it would still need 35 megawatts of standby natural gas plants still being paid to be there just for backup because they might be needed a couple of weeks of the year, um, which is essentially at, at the existing capacity. It's a, essentially this model is saying that we can't retire any of these gas plants. We have to pay to keep them in operation because solar and wind are too intermittent. So given, having described the, the structure of the system, I'm now gonna shift gears and talk about how a CCA works. Um, We've said that there are power generators. And this is an example from Clean Energy Alliance, which is forming in San Diego. Um, basically, a power generator, a CCA buys power on the open market. And no, no CCA actually owns power plants. They may contract with somebody. If you build a power plant, we'll buy a long-term contract with you. Or they might buy on this short-term open market but typically a CCA buys power. 
the utility is still responsible for the trans transportation of the power. And then the CCA is selling the power to its members. So that's the reason you're still getting two bills. Um, the way a CCA works is under the state law, any municipality or group of municipalities or county government can form a CCA and everybody within their territory is automatically a member of the CCA unless they choose to opt out. Um, CCAs, the, the, the state law that allowed CCAs to form was, was passed more than 10 years ago. It took off in a big way in Northern California, but it was much slower to come to Southern California. Uh, this chart shows green means there's a, a functioning CCA in these counties. Um, orange means they're, they're um, in the process of starting it up. Gray means they're thinking about it. There are some cities that have adopted CCAs ahead of everybody else. This little green dot in San Diego is Solana Beach. And actually this chart is a little bit obsolete because San Diego County is in, should be gold now. It is in the process of forming CCAs. But as you can see, it's, it's been a big deal, in, especially in the Bay Area. And the thing about a CCA is it's a, it's a public utility, if you will. It doesn't have shareholders that have to be paid. So typically, most CCAs sell electricity for slightly less than the utility because they don't want people to opt out. Um, but because they don't have to pay shareholders, they typically run at a surplus and can accumulate the surplus and can use it by state law, the municipality can't get the money. It can't go into the general budget of the municipality that formed the CCA, but it can be spent for the CCA on energy related improvements in the community. So the Northern California CCAs that have had a couple of years under their belt and have accumulated some significant funds have a whole bunch of different kinds of programs. This list is from Cal CCA which is the, the, organi the umbrella organization of CCAs in California. And you can go on their website. They've got lots of information about CCAs, including a drop-down list of all the different programs that different CCAs are doing. Um, they're doing a lot of things with building efficiency and electrification, a lot of things with electric car charging stations or, or electrification of transport. They're doing a lot of things on microgrids, which I'll get to later. Um, the, in general, I think every CCA that I know about is aiming to buy more green power than the minimum requirement required by the state. And this is a chart, again, from Cal CCA, showing that the existence of the CCAs has accelerated the transition to green power in the state. So the orange is what the, the investor-owned utilities were required to do. And this is showing that there's a bump because of the operation of the CCAs. Um, first of all, the CCAs, like every other load serving entity, are required to buy green power. But this is showing that they've bought more green power, that the slashes here are the amount of green power they bought in excess of what they had to buy. But it's also showing that because they took customers away from the utilities, and the utilities are now left with more generating capacity than they need, they of course shut down the not green power first. So in a, in a backhanded way, the operation of the CCAs is actually making the utilities greener. So CCAs can be a force for decarbonization. So <coughs> for many years, <coughs> the local utility SDG&E was dead set against you CCAs forming in San Diego. <clears throat> but as I explained, SDG&E is actually a part of a holding company, and the part of it that owns the transmission, and the part of it that was in the business of buying wholesale electricity and selling it at retail, are actually different divisions of the same holding company. And um, when San Diego began to seriously consider forming a CCA, Somebody at a very high level of SDG&E, or rather their holding company, Sempra, decided that actually the business about buying electricity on the wholesale market and selling it retail was not a business they wanted in. 
and they wrote to the state legislature saying, you know what, we want out of our monopoly position. The, the flip side of being a regulated monopoly, of course, is unlike any other business, you can't close. You can't walk away from the business. You need permission to leave it. So SDG&E is the first utility, I think, in the United States to ask for permission to cease being the seller of electricity to retail customers. And that means every community in San Diego County is going to have to form a CCA within the next couple of years, whether they've done it or not. So as of this moment, two joint power authorities, that is groups of cities that have gotten together to form a CCA, have already formed, they're in the process of filing the paperwork to start operations within the next year. In North County, there's the Clean Energy Alliance of three North County cities. And then the city of San Diego formed San Diego Community Power and invited a bunch of cities to join them. So a bunch of South County cities plus Encinitas have joined the city of San Diego to form a much larger JPA. Um, and between them, they represent the majority of load in San Diego County. But all the other, all the gray or incorporated cities that haven't made a decision to join one of these, one or the other of these or form their own CCA, but they're going to have to within a couple of years. And the county is going to have to um, before SDG&E walks away from this business. So within a couple of years, all of San Diego is going to be some number of CCAs. Nobody knows how many. Nobody knows if the county is going to form its own, if these other cities are going to join one of these or form their own. But there'll be some number of CCAs operational in San Diego County, and SDG&E will get permission to walk away and only be in the business of maintaining the wires. So there's, as I said, one CCA in San Diego right now, Solana Energy Alliance formed uh, two years ago. Um, and they are consciously um, greener than the state requirement. Their default choice, which everybody was put on automatically unless they opted out, was 33% greener than the state requirement and cost less than SDG&E power. They have an option to pay extra and not very much extra, a few percent, and go to 100% renewable energy. Um, and this is the goal of Clean Energy Alliance, the North County one that's forming. And what they're comparing here is, this is the state requirement. It gets more stringent and then it levels off. SDG&E sells a product similar to the um, SDA's, uh, you know, I, I'll pay extra to be green, but all you get is about not quite 50% green. And that product is actually going to merge with the state minimum anyway. Um, Clean Energy Alliance is intending that their um, base product will be greener than SDG&E's green product. And their 100% product will be, of course, 100%. And over the next uh, couple of decades, they're going to go to 100% green energy by 2030, ahead of the state's requirement of 2050. So they have ambitious goals to be greener than an investor-owned utility would be. Because SDG&E's intent is just to stay with the state minimum. Um, the San Diego group also has ambitious goals for um, local green power and development. But here's what I want to point out, and here's some weasel words. This is, this is from their founding documents of the San Diego CCA. They're going to have local energy programs, energy efficiency, distributed generation. But it says these are going to be phased in during the first several years, only after identification of requisite funding sources. So, you know, they're going to be green, but there's uh, some weasel words there. So um, what's, what's the holdup? What, what makes it difficult for CCAs to move forward? Um, we've said that Solana Beach has the only operating CCA. And um, the Union Tribute had a somewhat gleeful article saying that the Solana Beach CCA might have to raise its rates so they're not lower than um, SDG&E while being greener. And the article explains that the, um, the CCA is being hit 
with two kinds of fees that are required by the state. One called the power charge and different adjustment, and the other is the RA, resource adequacy charges I've been talking about. And we'll go into some detail on that because this is very critical for the operation of CCAs. This is Solana Energy Alliance's charges for resource adequacy from their report. And the point they're making is that in 2018, the charges, there's actually three kinds of resource adequacy because some of it has to come locally, but it wasn't, I mean, it was, it cost them, but it was pretty much flat all year. And it was on the order of, you know, a couple of dollars per kilowatt per month. In 2020, it went from like a dollar fifteen to seventeen dollars. So the price of resource adequacy is shooting up, and that hit their budget by like three hundred thousand dollars, which meant that it was a big enough hit that they actually had to change their rates. So this business about resource adequacy, this requirement that solar and wind are not recognized as providing reliability to the grid. And therefore, anybody who's a load serving entity has to buy this backup power from gas plants that actually aren't running is a big hit to the CCAs and an issue that is debated before the um, PUC and the CAISO. Um, the other charge is even more subtle. It's called the power charge and different adjustment. And the concept here is this. Once upon a time, this is from um, a Northern California CCA. So their local utility was PG&E. So the concept was PG&E owned or was paying, had contracts with generating plants and owned the transmission and they're selling to customers. So now, most of their customers have gone to Marin Clean Energy. And Marin Clean Energy has, has contracted to buy power. In many cases, because the price of renewable energy has gone down by so much, Marin Clean Energy can buy green energy for a lot less than the long-term contracts that uh, PG&E had in place. So PG&E is now stuck with long-term contracts that they can't sell the power for, or if they want to get out of the contracts, they're going to have to pay. But PG&E is a regulated monopoly. Their prices, their profits are guaranteed by state law. So PG&E is able to go to the utility commission and say, help, help. We're not going to make our guaranteed profit because we've lost all these customers and we still have to pay these now obsolete and inefficient plants. And therefore, we have to be made whole. And therefore, anybody who leaves, whether they leave to go to a, a CCA, or whether it's a big business that you know builds their own generating plant and stops buying from PG&E, anybody who stops buying from a, a regulated utility has to pay this fee, which lasts as long as it takes to retire the older plants. Um, and that's a non-trivial expense that burdens the, the, the CCAs until these old contracts expire. So people look at the CCA and saying, oh, I'm not saving as much money as I thought I would. Well, part of that is going to make the investor-owned utilities whole so they don't lose money. And that's, that's the way the rules are written right now. The other charge that's considered burdensome and has been a big debate before the PUC is what are called transmission access charges. Remember I said that the bill has two components. There's a component of what it costs to generate the electricity. And there's the component of what it costs to distribute it. Well, that represents two things because remember there's the transmission grid, the very high voltage power lines that run long distances. And then the local grid that runs within the city at lower voltage. At the moment, the entire cost of transmission, the long distance transmission and the local distribution is lumped together and applied on a per kilowatt hour basis to everybody's bill. But the people who are interested in Travis, who's here, is in this business of building local generating plants that aren't, you know, hundreds of megawatts out in the desert, but maybe 
you know, hundreds of kilowatts somewhere in the neighborhood. Um, arguably, a plant like that doesn't require the long distance transmission grid because its power can be put directly on the distribution grid. So arguably, they're being unfairly burdened if they're if electricity coming from a plant which is local to a CCA is charged the transmission access charge um, because really they're never using the long distance transmission grid. And to charge them that fraction of the transmission access charge, it's as though they were sending the electricity far away and then bringing it back again. Um, so this is a slide from our partner Clean Coalition who's been arguing before the PUC that this is inappropriate and that the transmission access charge should be applied at the transition from the transmission grid to the distribution grid. And there should be a separate charge for using the distribution grid so that somebody who built a local, what's called distributed generation, um, should only pay for that portion of the distribution grid they're using and not pay for the transmission grid. And they just are about to change the rules such that a new, a new local plant, this is not gonna be grandfathered, but a new local plant will not be charged for the transmission grids, transmission access charges, which will make local generation less unfavored relative to these giant plants out in the desert. Because if you think about it, from the utilities point of view, since they're paid a guaranteed fraction of what they invest, they're happy to see you know, giant plants built out in the desert because it means they're gonna need more transmission grid. They build more transmission grid, they're paid more for it. Um, local, you know, more distributed loads aren't as desirable from that point of view, from that viewpoint. Anyway, my point is, <clears throat> it's, it's a given that we are going to have CCAs in San Diego. Exactly how many is to be determined, but it's given that there's going to be CCAs. Our mission then is to prevent them from becoming utilities version two, from just slipping into, we're going to just do the same thing as the utilities are going to do. They have ambitious goals, but they're burdened by unfair regulation and the CCAs and the local governments and the politicians representing us in Sacramento have to fight this. The regulation is depriving them of part of the revenue they could use to create local programs. And most importantly, each CCA has to decide, is their only goal to reduce the rates as much as possible? Or are they gonna retain some of the earnings to enrich the communities um, by programs that you know, make the communities more efficient and in the long term, save the communities money. Because some of the Northern California CCAs have been very successful that way. Some of the CCAs that are forming in inland communities that are more conservative have taken the attitude that, well, we just want to cut electricity rates as much as possible. So we're not going to worry about, you know, having programs to make our community more efficient. So the the two that are forming in San Diego have at least said in their forming documents that we want to have community programs. But on the other hand, they're, you know, they're burdened by these various fees. And they've said, well, we're not going to do community programs until we have surplus cash. So they're kind of, um, you know, they're torn two ways. Uh, but they have it in their power to transform the energy system. And that's the next thing I want to get to. We mentioned microgrids. Uh, you probably are, have been in California long enough to remember a couple of years ago, somebody pulled the wrong lever in a transformer station in Arizona, and the entire grid went down for all of Arizona and Southern California. The grid is actually fairly tender in an engineering sense. It's prone to these cascade failures. And the, actually, some of the people who were involved in the design of KISO are rethinking how the grid should be organized and want to see it organized into a hierarchy of microgrids. This figure is from, again, from Clean Coalition's um, proposal. The concept here is that the transmission line is down and it, presumably this truck ran down a, a tower. But this community, their local transformer station has a battery at the transformer station. And critical facilities like hospitals and fire stations and police stations and schools have their own batteries and their own solar 
and maybe there's some community scale solar like like Travis builds, you know, in the community tied into this transformer station. And this transformer station has the capacity to detach itself from the grid, but hold up its neighborhood. Probably there's not enough solar to hold up everything. Everybody can't keep running their air conditioners, but it'll hold up the critical facilities. It'll allow people to have enough power to keep their refrigerators going. Um, and as the grid is reestablished, these things can connect themselves to the grid piecemeal, so the grid can be brought up again in an orderly way. Um, the, the concept, this is from the Clean Coalition slide again, the concept is that they, they divide loads into levels of criticality. So there's enough generating capacity in the community to hold up critical loads, things like hospitals, all the time. There's enough to keep up priority loads for some significant fraction of the time. And there's enough to keep up the discretionary loads, meaning everybody's house, for maybe a few hours. So a community doesn't have to be able to make all its power to be a lot more resilient. And the concept is that if, if CCAs have some surplus capital, they can get into this, make power locally, and have local batteries. Local batteries are the way to get away from this duck curve and this requirement to buy um, generating capacity that, that sits in idle because the batteries can serve the evening requirement. And the point is batteries have gotten a lot cheaper, much cheaper than people expected. That is the rate at which batteries are getting cheaper has been very much faster than people expect. This was from a study by Bloomberg. And just in the last few days, the most recent announcements from Tesla are it's gonna get even cheaper, even faster. So rather than rely on um, batteries on, on generating plants into the indefinite future, we should be looking at distributed energy, distributed batteries, and local microgrids. Um, and the, I mean, the, the advantages of this for a community, first of all, is the resiliency advantage we talked about. It means that to the extent that a community has distributed energy resources, they pay less for these peak and demand charges. So the money stays in the community. It creates local jobs and it gets us off paying for transmission. And most importantly, the local energy is all renewable energy. So it accelerates decarbonization. So what can you do? Well, let me, let me just tell you a little bit of what um, the Center of Community Energy is doing. We were formed to advocate before the PUC. And we've been arguing with the PUC about this business about requiring the CCAs to buy backup power from gas powered power plants years into the future um, on the grounds that you're not estimating how fast batteries are getting cheaper and it would be better to hold off and, and see if we can't build out some of this local power and local uh, energy um, rather than continue to commit to uh, fossil fuel plants. Um, you need, all of us need to press the local CCAs to start their local program sooner rather than later, especially community scale PV, batteries, locally distributed batteries, their energy efficiency programs. The other thing that can be done to manage the duck curve is what's called demand management. That is smart appliances and, and devices and buildings that avoid running in the evening and automatically displace the power to other times of the day. Um, you can, I hope, support us in our efforts to advocate before the PUC. And we, in cooperation with the San Diego Energy District, will be hosting a symposium, a virtual symposium, on June 5th, where we're gonna bring in a bunch of experts to talk about what's involved in creating a CCA. And um, all of you, by virtue of being members of NCCA, are invited to that and are entitled to a free pass. So anybody who wants to go on to the website here, San Diego Energy District.org, go to the symposium tab. If you ask for a ticket and you say my affiliation is NCCA, you'll get a free ticket. And you can hear a bunch of very high level experts talk about the all the topics I've talked about here in much greater detail. 
So I hope you all um, take a role in keeping our local CCAs moving in the right direction. And now, um, I haven't been keeping track of the questions, but um, Carl has, I think. So um, I will take questions. Yes, I have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tori Bueno. I appreciate um, the very succinct uh, messages that you just gave us. You, you dove deep, but you also didn't spend too much time uh, belaboring these issues. So you covered a lot of ground. So I appreciate that. Um, I've tried to order these questions. Uh, some of the folks had a couple questions, so I tried to be equitable and uh, stack them up so that folks got at least their first question asked. Uh, first one I have is from Joe, and it says, what is the present and future of batteries for clean energy use? Um, are you asking the types of batteries or the capacities or what? I mean, there's maybe just your your own uh, viewpoint on how quickly they're going to come and how 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 much impact you think that can at, make. At this point, it is cost effective for someone to to purchase a battery. That wasn't true even maybe a year or eighteen months ago, but we've crossed the threshold. One of the things I would very much like the CCAs to do is to create rates that rewards people having batteries. The local utility is almost against people having batteries. Um, but a CCA could create rates that rewarded people having batteries, which would certainly make them cost effective. And at this point, there's two markets for batteries. One is um, there's a bunch of companies, including Tesla and LG, who sell um, home batteries especially in conjunction, they don't have to be, but typically they're installed in conjunction with a solar array and used to store the electricity during the day and then use it at night. It's called self-consumption. Um, and that is cost effective now in San Diego, especially with the state incentives. And oh, by the way, if you're in a high fire district or in an economically disadvantaged district, the state incentive is so good that a battery is practically free. Um, the other big market for batteries is medium-sized commercial establishments. Um, I've done some calculations around um, what a supermarket can do. A battery basically the size of a, of a truck, um, you know, one of these containers that you see on trucks, would power a supermarket for, you know, an evening and keep the, uh, the refrigerators powered for several days if it had solar. <clears throat> one of <coughs> excuse, excuse me, one of the problems they had in Northern California when these communities had their power shut off for days is not only did everybody lose what was in their refrigerator, but the supermarkets left lost what was in storage. Um, so it created a crisis. Um, probably every food storage facility ought to have a battery. That's part of what you know having a, a community microgrid would be. Every critical facility ought to have a big battery. It doesn't take a lot of room. And as I've said, the prices have gotten to the point where just the savings on avoiding these demand charges can pay for a battery. And if the CCAs had appropriate programs to reward people, we're very interested in creating things where, where you know, somebody finances the battery so you can install one for no money you know, out of pocket. But it's... I think we're there. We've crossed the threshold and it's going to get, you know, better and better. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, here's one from Serena. Is using regular lighting going to increase our energy uses that much? I know we aren't supposed to use big appliances like washing machines, dishwashers, etc. during peak evening hours, but we can only decrease our energy usage so much. Um, Actually, lighting, if, if you go to LED lighting, lighting becomes a very small fraction of the use in a house or a building for that matter. LED lights are remarkably more efficient than old style incandescence. They're even more efficient than fluorescence. So big commercial buildings are actually finding it cost effective to replace fluorescence with LED lights. Okay, so the... I guess the answer then is the big appliances really are the killers because you're going to assume that we're all, everybody in our club has already moved to LEDs and if they yeah. haven't, they should be doing that now. Yes. Okay. The, um, 
One of the big transitions is the state wants to get away from natural gas in buildings because that's one of the main sources of greenhouse gas out of the built environment is um, hot water heaters and building heaters by burning natural gas because obviously it's a source of CO2 and also methane is a, a worse greenhouse gas than, that, than CO2 by a factor of more than 10 and the distribution system leaks. So it would be very much better if there wasn't all this network of pipes bringing natural gas into every building. So the state has programs to encourage, first of all, not building any more buildings that use natural gas, but to build buildings all electric. And there will be programs to encourage, and some of the CCAs are doing this already, encourage the retrofitting of buildings with heat pumps because the first generation of electric heaters were just resistance heaters. And that's, um, that uses a relatively large amount of electricity relative to a heat pump, which is about three times more effective. So it's certainly true that you use less, even if you're burning natural gas to run a generator, it's better to make a heat pump to get the heat in your house than to take the natural gas to your house and burn the natural gas to make the heat in your house. So there's, um, there's a push to retrofit buildings with heat pumps. That's another okay. thing CCAs could finance if they accumulate surplus. In other words, uh, the CCA, because it's not a for-profit and they're not selling gas, they may have some good reasons to help you on the right path. And some of them have done that in a big way. Okay. Um, this question comes from Jay. How much power is now coming from renewable energy statewide compared to fossil fuel? Well, as I've shown, it varies over the course of the day. It's about 50% net. Um, the state has ambitious goals to get to 100%, but it's going to have to deal with the duck curve to do it. it it's a, it's, here's a very simple calculation. Solar is so cheap now that we could make enough power to power the whole state just by approximately doubling the amount of solar we've installed. And it would cost much less than we spent already because the price of solar has come down so much. The problem is we'd only have power during the day and we have to deal with the duck curve. And everybody, this, this is the thing that everybody who works in this business has got themselves wrapped around is, how are we gonna have power in the evening? It's conceivable that we'd have enough power from things like geothermal um, or hydroelectric power, which is, isn't, quote, renewable, but it is greenhouse gas free, um, to run the state at night when the usage is the lowest. But everybody's wrapped around how are we going to handle the peak in usage in the evening. And if that's only batteries, it's going to be a lot of batteries, unless batteries are, get much cheaper. There's a lot of interest in other methods of storing electricity. Pumped hydro is one. I don't know if you've ever seen this plan to have a thing that raises concrete blocks high and then lowers them and lets the, the energy that's recovered by a motor running backwards um, recover the energy. Um, somebody, uh, a company founded, funded by Bill Gates just announced a battery with 150 hours of capacity, which is huge. So there's a lot of interest in methods of storage, but that's, that's the, the, the rate limiting step at this point. It's not the generating green energy. We can do that. We know how to do it. We can do it at a, it's cheaper than generating electricity with fossil fuel. The problem is having electricity in the evening. Okay, next question comes from uh, Carl, uh, not me, Carl, Carl Kreider. And, um, and maybe you can elaborate on this after I ask the question too, because it does seem that there's uh, two different incentives. One's money and the other is greenhouse gas. So let's, let's consider this question in both arrays. But um, we generally run our dishwasher, Carl says, after 10 p.m. Is there a better time? And he mentions that he charges his car. So they've got an electric car with a timer between midnight and 5 a.m. because that seems preferable. So uh, can you tell us uh, what makes sense financially and then also what makes sense greenhouse gas wise? Um, to the extent that they can manage to do it 
in setting rates, the state attempts to match price to greenhouse gas generation. It's not perfect, but there's actually a graph you can find that attempts to show how well they've made the, they, they call it price signaling. They're trying to tell you by how they adjust the price, how much greenhouse gas is being generated. Um, so the, the, the two answers are somewhat correlated. The answer is, it depends whether you have solar on your own building. If you own solar, you're producing just probably almost surely a surplus of power during the day. So it's in your interest to use as much of that power as you can yourself, self-consumption, rather than sell it to the utility because the rate the utility pays you is proportional to the current rate. So if you're making power during the day and selling it to them at the lower rate, and then you need it in the evening and buying it from them at the higher rate, you're disadvantaged. So you're better off to the extent you can adjust things. If you have solar, use the solar power yourself during the day and minimize how much you have to buy in the evening. If you do need power in the evening, you're better off pushing it off after 9 p.m. because the rate goes down after 9 p.m. And because after 9 p.m., some of these gas plants can be shut down and the state can rely on hydroelectric power that it's getting from, you know, the, the northern town, the, the states north of us. Um, so basically avoid five to nine is the, is the bottom line. And the, the rates are designed to encourage you to do exactly that. Yeah, it's interesting. I looked on the um, sdg and a site uh, a few days ago, and the time of use ranged only two cents between the worst and best cases for most of their time of use plans. So it's almost not even being uh, really a, a penalty in either way. But the one system that they have, the program they have right now that's a real standout is the electric car one, yes. which gives you a, a really bonus rate of nine cents per kilowatt hour between midnight and six. But that's undoubtedly going to be coming from natural gas at some point when we have enough electric cars, right? Um, yeah, actually at some point they'll switch over to wanting electric cars to charge during the day. Actually, there's a very interesting technology which, which we're looking forward to, which is if you think about the number of cars there are and you imagine that some substantial fraction, say 40% or so of cars were electric, you can imagine a world where um, what's called vehicle to grid. People drive to work, plug in at work, have their car fully charged when they leave work, drive home, plug it in, and instead of charging it, discharge it during the evening hours into their home and indirectly into the grid, and then don't recharge it until the next day because they had the average person only drives a relatively short distance relative to the capacity of their battery. So you could actually imagine that the sum of the batteries in electric cars, when electric cars become common, would be a grid resource. And there are actually groups working on this. There's a, um, who is it? I think maybe Davis, UC Davis, has enough electric vehicles that they have them, when they're plugged in, they make them available for grid regulation so that if there's a problem on the grid, they can inject power into the grid out of their batteries. And they're paid for that because you can be paid for short-term grid, grid stability. Um, it's another market. And they're paid enough for that to pay for enough electricity to charge all their electric vehicles. So someday electric vehicles might be a major source of um, grid storage. Okay, the next question uh, is from Tara, and she, she made this question uh, when you were speaking about the broken system of resource adequacy and how uh, it seems like people are getting dinged for that in a way that was uh, rigging. Um, she said, does, does this model uh, look seriously at energy storage? In other words, when they made that crazy model where they require uh, any power company that's dealing with renewables to also have the battery, or sorry, the fossil fuel backup, did they seriously consider that storage was in the mix or is coming in the mix? Well, it's coming. And, and certain of the utilities, <clears throat> actually LA just made a big decision on this. LA, LA owns its own utility. 
So they're less regulated than um, other utilities because the, the PUC has less power over a municipal utility than that over anybody else. So LA had a series of big gas plants that as often happens, happens to be in a, in a poorer neighborhood. Um, and they were reaching end of life. And they actually had already entered into a contract to replace them at, at enormous expense. And the city government intervened because of course the LADWP is a division of the city government. So they have much tighter control over it than a municipality has over CCA. And uh, the city government intervened and said, don't finalize that contract until you've modeled batteries. And they put out a contract and um, I think it was Tesla, but it might've been LG. Somebody bid for a battery system big enough to replace a gas plant to meet that requirement. And since then, a couple of other big battery plants have been installed. So there is a movement afoot to um, replace these backup generators with large battery banks. Um, the debate that's going on before the PUC right now, and I've been, I, as an intervener, I see all these documents and I get to, as a, as a representative of the public, I get to opine on these documents. And basically the argument I've been making is they shouldn't require the load serving entities to buy three years into the future because batteries are getting cheaper so fast and it's so fast to install batteries that rather than require them to buy three years into the future where they'll probably have to pay, you know, for a contract with a power plant, um, they should just let them wait and see how much RA they need and see if they can't by that time um, satisfy it with batteries because it is coming on. Big battery plants have been ordered um, and, and they are, replacing natural gas plants. So yes, it's possible. It's just a question of um, loosening the regulations enough to let it happen. I, I appreciate that story you just had about Mayor Garcetti because I remember that battle. We had uh, Food and Water Watch and Sunrise Movement and some of the other activists up in LA uh, were really getting up in arms about those three peakers they were planning on putting in. Mm -hmm. So um, they really did uh, help make the decision a lot harder for Garcetti to go the easy route. And it sounded like it, it went the right way. It was way very people, successful. Yeah. people and, and it showed it could be done and a bunch of other plants, even bigger have happened in um, Oakland. I think it was, they had a horrible old peaker that was actually burned jet fuel. So it was even dirtier than a natural gas plant. And right again, you know, what a coincidence. These things keep being in the poorest neighborhoods. Um, and it was, it was up for replacement and they convinced themselves they could replace it with a battery plant and did. So that was one of the first big purchases of a battery plant by a CCA. And it, you know, in addition to saving the money, saved a great deal of pollution in downtown Oakland. So that was a big success. Okay. This next question comes from me. Actually, I did put it in order as they were coming <laughs> through. Um, the environmental justice uh, movement has shown us that communities of color and people who own the least pay the most in terms of pollution. Um, in your opinion, uh, and based on your experience, what you've seen other CCAs try to do, what is the best route for a CCA to develop community-owned solar to help reverse that problem? Um, the CCAs have um, created mechanisms for funding community solar, some CCAs have created mechanisms for funding community solar out of their surplus. Um, that's what I'd like to see the local CCAs doing. The local CCAs have language in their charter documents, um, you know, suggesting that they're aiming to do that. Because as, as I pointed out, there's some, um, you know, it's not, it's not a given, it's, a, it's an aspirational kind of thing. So, um, but I think, I think community microgrids are the key because it puts power back in the hands of the community, literally um, and figuratively. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's by its nature non-polluting power. So, and it, it by its nature creates local jobs. So I really, I think funding the transition to community microgrids is the key to, you know, for environmental justice. 
Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Nikki. Um, and I know you, you already gave one example, but um, she asked the question sp ex explicitly, what's the single most important and practical thing that we can do to progress renewables while we're locked down? In general or with respect to CCAs? Uh, I guess, I guess, uh, well. Well, yeah, uh, to, to not to be too You can answer both. <laughs> the single most important thing you can do is be politically involved and get rid of our current federal government. That's, that's the single, I mean, that has to do with health, that has to do with environment, has to do with everything. Because um, the federal government at this point is doing every place where they can make a decision, they're doing the wrong thing. The, you know, I deal with the PUC and I feel like, you know, their heart's in the right place, but they, they're more comfortable with big plants and small plants. So they have to be constantly juggled along but they're not actively doing the wrong thing at every, you know, every opportunity. So I'm sorry to say the most important thing is, is being politically active. And at the moment that seems to be writing letters. There's, you know, groups that are organizing to write letters to, you know, voters who are, uh, you know, don't vote all the time. Um, the other thing you can do is with respect to local things, the CCAs all have, you know, community input and advisory committees and things. Be active on that, you know, hold their feet to the fire, make sure they really do follow up on their aspirations and create these community programs. And, um, you know, create microgrids, create community batteries, community, you know, solar, all, all these things that they, that have been done in the bigger, more established CCAs. And, um, you know, should happen locally. I, I said bigger, but actually I should mention that the San Diego CCA is going to be instantaneously one of the biggest in the world because of the size of the city of San Diego. Jose, it's interesting you mentioned uh, the community um, advisory committee. We have a member uh, of, of that San Diego Community Power Advisory Committee on the on the meeting tonight. So okay. she's already asked a question. So uh, <laughs> they're paying attention, and uh, we appreciate that that folks in the community are are helping out. Um, next question comes from Marie, who I know just logged off, but she said she's going to watch the replay of this. Um, she said she asked, "How do CCAs compare and contrast with San Diego franchise agreement with Sandy uh, with SDG&E?" Well, they're very, they're covering different things. The San Diego Franchise Agreement is the agreement whereby the SDG&E has the monopoly on running the grid. And they are still under a CCA going to get paid for running that grid. And as you saw, that actually for just about everybody represents a larger fraction of their electric bill than the generation. So even if the CCAs take over generation, and even if they're a couple of percent smaller, if a CCA is selling you power for, you know, say 3% less, but your generation is only half your bill, that means your bill is only gonna go down by 1.5%. So there's gonna need to be some education because people are not gonna, you know, people are gonna be disappointed <clears throat> by how little their bill goes down. The franchise agreement is a whole other question. Um, that's negotiated periodically. Um, it's up for renegotiation in just a couple of years. SDG&E would like it to be, oh, just keep it as it is and give us another 50 years. And certain people have suggested that, you know, maybe the city should be a little bit more, you know, hard negotiator here and either not extend it as long or require um, you know, more out of the SDG&E than they're required to now. <clears throat> you know, right now, the rules are the more they spend, the more they're paid. Um, there's actually a proposal that the whole organization of utilities, that is the owners of the wires, should be changed to be more like the relationship that a buyer of telecommunications has with a telecommunications company. No telecommunications company, um, wholesale telecommunications company, is paid for how much they spend. They're paid for the capacity they deliver multiplied by a reliability factor. Um, 
and that's the norm in that industry. So it's been suggested by certain people who think about this, that that ought to be the transition in the utility industry. That's kind of anathema to the, you know, the owners of utility stock. I think it would be a big, big political struggle to make that change. Um, I think there's going to be an effort to put some uh, performance requirements into um, SDG&E's new negotiations. But it's, you know, it depends who the city government is and how hard, how hard they negotiate, how much they can get out of the, the uh, franchise agreement. But it's a, it's a separate topic from what a CCA does. The CCAs won't even be involved in that, except in some advisory capacity. I, I have to agree with you about what you just said about um, the fact that um, a big portion of the bill continues to go to the owners of the transmission lines and there's an exit fee that we uh, pay yeah. back um, yes. that, that the uh, utility gets. Um, I know in a presentation that the county gave on CCAs, they said um, it still would re remain 75% of what you, what every consumer paid still continues to go to SDG&E. What do you think the chances are that uh, PG&E just gets bought out by the munis municipality altogether? Um. They, some of the Northern California municipalities have offered to buy parts of PG&E. And that's very interesting because PG&E is in bankruptcy. So technically the bankruptcy judge has to get the best deal for the creditors. So arguably if the, um, the municipalities put enough money on the table, uh, SDG&E SDG doesn't get to say no. Although it's looking like the judge is gonna allow them to remain a, a going entity and not break them up. Um, th there's a subtlety there, which has to do with this whole business of the distribution grid, and actually the, the whole business about um, you know, suburban sprawl. If you think about the amount of infrastructure that you have to build per building, the more um, dense buildings, housing, and all buildings are, the more meters you get per mile of wire that you strung. So if you're in downtown San Diego and you know every block has a 20-story apartment building, then the even though the, the wires are all underground and they're much more expensive, the ratio between how much infrastructure you have and how much you're collecting is much more favorable. If you go out in the back country and everybody's on a hundred acre lot, and you have to run a mile of wire just to serve one house. The fact of the matter is they can't possibly be making money with the transmission charges to those you know, residences out in the back country. In effect, the urban dwellers are subsidizing the suburban dwellers. Um, and so the, the nightmare from PG&E was when the city of San Francisco said, yeah, we'll buy all your wires in San Francisco. That's where all the money is coming from. If, if they did that and PG&E was left with, oh, we have all these wires strung for miles out in the country and you know, only a customer every mile and all these trees that we have to keep cutting down, they'd be doomed. So they howled and screamed and, and begged the judge not to do that. And, and it sounds like that's not gonna happen. Um, but there is an inherent um, asymmetry there. I predict that as batteries and solar get cheaper, it will reach a point where it's no longer cost effective to maintain the rural grid. And um, it will become cost effective to actually bribe people to, to grid disconnect and form microgrids. And small communities will form microgrids, which is already happening in Northern California for reliability reasons. And these people who live way out in the country, who have these long power lines going to them, at some point that the power company is going to go to them and say, you know what, we'd rather you stop being our customer because it's costing us more to you know, cut the trees back from these wires than we're ever going to make charging you your transmission charges. The other big change that would hugely impact people's transmission charges I showed those demand charges that are applied to commercial customers and everybody is going to be transitioned to these time of use rates where you pay the most in the evening. If batteries get cheap enough, 
everybody's going to have a battery and charge it during the day and not use electricity in the evening or not use it any more than they're using it during the day. Um, and then they will get out from under a lot of those transition transmission charges. So one thing a CCA could do that would save its customers a lot of money was help them get batteries in part because it's going to save the CCA from some of these resource adequacy charges. But the, the other effect is the customers will pay much less for these time of use charges and demand charges. And the customers will see their bill go down because less money is going to the utility for the transmission charges. So that's the big impact they could have. And it's dependent on batteries getting cheap and programs to encourage people to go forward with batteries. Because right now, it's, it's, it's not happening on the scale that it should on a purely economic analysis. It sounds like you're telling us to invest in LG and Tesla batteries. <laughs> well, the trouble is you don't know who the next guy is going to be. But, right. You know, given the price of Tesla, who knows? Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, by the way, I don't want anyone to think that I asked, uh, gave them investment advice. That's, that's <laughs> not what I'm doing there. Um, this question comes from Merrill. Uh, at what future date do you anticipate the storage, whether it's batteries, pumped hydro, et cetera, will be able to replace fossil fuel altogether, assuming the CPUC capitulates on their current policies? It depends entirely on how fast the cost of long-term storage can be brought down. Um, if you listen to some of the experts who, you know, opine before the, the PUC, it'll never happen. We're going to need fossil fuel plants forever. But on the other hand, you have to ask who's paying those experts. Um, I think that we're not more than a decade away from being able to, between all the various schemes for um, non, you know, fossil fuel energy, there, there's a whole aspect of this I haven't touched on, which is the, um, what's called the diversity benefit. Um, We've said solar goes away during the day and wind goes away when it's not windy, but the, the more different kinds of renewable energy you have, the less you're impacted by this business about the derating of renewable energy, because in some sense, they're not all derated at the same time. Um, and especially if they had a more sophisticated algorithm for figuring it out. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, solar is the cheapest per kilowatt hour. So there's a temptation for everybody who's buying electricity to contract with solar plants. It would actually be better if the state had a bigger mix of different kinds of renewable energy. So um, geothermal is a huge benefit for this purpose because it runs all the time. The state's gonna retire its last nuclear power plant and it probably should try to replace it with geothermal. Um, wind, um, not land-based wind, but, but wind based at sea has the advantage that the wind is much steadier at sea and somewhat counter cyclical with the sunlight. Um, so one CCA in California has actually let the first contract for an offshore wind farm in Northern California. There's very strong um, offshore breezes in Northern California. So um, I think if the state installs an optimal mix of uh, renewable, different kinds of renewable energy. And if storage, especially long-term storage gets cheap enough, I think it's doable and I don't think it'll take more than a decade or two. But there's a lot of experts that can be hired that'll tell you that it's not doable. Jose, what does it look like to put a new geothermal uh, power plant in, and can we do it in California? What, what are they? California is the world leader in geothermal. Um, a couple of decades ago, there was a big burst of geothermal because there are areas in California where hot bodies of magma are very close to the surface, and so it was easy to build geothermal. Interestingly, the, um, the collapse of the price of oil may be a big benefit to geothermal because the, um, the, the main cost in geothermal is the initial drilling. And as long as the uh, fracking business was such a hot item, uh, drilling rigs are relatively expensive to rent. 
a lot of these companies that had been, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the fracking is that you have to keep drilling new wells. Um, so the, the fracking industry was keeping the drillers very busy and keeping their prices high. And now that there's been a collapse of oil price, the, the, the immediate thing is they stop drilling new wells. Um, and so there's a lot of idle rigs and a lot of the owners of idle rigs have started to look around for new work. And they've approached the geothermal companies and started offering them big discounts. So that may strongly impact the finances of geothermal because it's very much a front loaded business. So geothermal doesn't look like one massive plant. It's a little more distributed. Yes. It's, it's, um, a geothermal plant is a, a collection of wells. So and it, it typically, I mean, there's regions that the government has put a great deal of effort into mapping, um, you know, what the most desirable regions are. Um, and California happens to be well endowed with geothermal hotspots. Um, but the other research that's been pushed in geothermal is if you can make geothermal more efficient, then you can do it profitably in more different areas. But California hasn't even fully exploited the very best geothermal resources it has. <clears throat> um, last question. I think you kind of covered this, but maybe you can give some e examples. This comes from Jay, who I know you know. Um, are there any CCAs in our state able to set up and install their own solar battery microgrids to reduce greenhouse gases and lower the cost of electricity to the residents? Well, to be clear, when you say their own, just about every CCA I'm aware of works through contractors. So um, there are CCAs interested in causing microgrids to come into existence. I think it's the one in Lancaster did a really interesting experimental project with a housing development where they put in one master meter um, and got rid of all the individual meters and effectively made the entire, you know, I don't know how many hundred units in this housing development, one giant microgrid. And the CCA was very instrumental in that, but they didn't do the whole thing themselves. They did it in partnership with, um, not LG, but one of the other battery companies, and I think some solar companies. So the CCAs have done this, but generally as facilitators. Um, as I've said, the most important thing CCAs can do is design rate plans to encourage the right thing. And something, something I'd like to see them do is, is to try, I've talked to the CCAs and their, you know, their answer is, well, we're, you know, we're so poor right now, we're you know, starting up on a, on a you know, shoestring. We can't think about any of this advanced stuff because it's, it's pretty complex stuff to design rates. I am like to see the CCAs go and try to get some foundation money from some of these green foundations to design advanced rates so that as soon as they launch, they have rates that encourage the right behavior. And, and that, you know, microgrids, batteries, local solar are the things that they should be rewarding by rate design. And some of the Northern California CCAs are already doing that kind of thinking. I agree. And I think that um, my question earlier about community solar, I think, is one that as I ask, um, I find that the CCAs are all intimidated about just acquiring power and they feel like it's just too much of a hurdle for them to get involved with building uh, power in the, in the locations uh, in our communities. But ultimately, that's, that's where they know their heads need to be. We just need to figure out a way to fast track that. Even the, I mean, if you go onto the Cal CCA website, You'll see CCAs have caused, I forget what the number is, it's huge, it's terawatts of power, you know, hundreds of gigawatts of power to come into existence. But if you read the fine print, they actually don't own a single one of those plants. They came into existence because they made a deal with somebody, <clears throat> what's called a power purchase agreement, right? You build this plant, we'll guarantee to buy power for n years at this price. <clears throat> and then some developer, you know, like Travis or bigger than Travis, depending on how big the plant is, you know, went to a bank and said, you know, or a giant Wall Street finance firm or somebody and said, you know, give us a million dollars or a hundred million dollars or whatever, and we'll build a 
you know, a plant of whatever size, because look, I have this piece of paper from a CCA that says they're going to buy it, and therefore I'm bankable. So the CCAs don't literally build the plant in the sense that it's their people building it, but they caused it to be built by guaranteeing they buy the electricity. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned Lancaster earlier. If folks don't know, um, Lancaster, California is a, like Disneyland of the, uh, you know, modern green power uh, space. There's a lot going on in Lancaster that we should be paying attention to. They, uh, they moved an electric bus company in, in there, mm -hmm. and they've really been out ahead uh, building their own CCA, um, extending that to other, uh, not necessarily even neighboring spaces. They're telling towns that are not connected to them. If you'd like to join in on our CCA, we'll help you get started. So neat stuff going up on up in Lancaster for sure. They have a very interesting model. They're actually a, a joint authority of CCAs. So the, I forget the name of the, of the umbrella group, but it does the purchasing, but each town gets to set its own rates. So if there's one town who are like, oh, we just want the rates as cheap as possible. We don't care if you know, we can have any programs. It's like, fine, you can set your rates the way you want. Santa Barbara joined Lancaster CCA. <clears throat> Santa Barbara decided they want to make 100% green power the default, knowing that it would make the rates go up relative to the utility they were displacing. And Santa Barbara is you know, so wealthy and so liberal that they felt they could do that. So they joined the Lancaster CCA because under that one, each community gets to set its own rates. So that, that was actually one of the bones of contention between the North County communities and city of San Diego. And the reason they're forming two CCAs in, in San Diego, um, the North County cities were afraid that the city of San Diego would have all the rate making power if they joined the city of San Diego CCA. So, and <clears throat> I don't know why they didn't adopt the Lancaster model, but they didn't. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna wrap up here, uh, but, but we do have a few closing points. Um, Marion, are you on and do you have yourself unmuted? Let me see if we can get. You went back on mute. Okay. Oh, good. Now you are. Buttons. Okay. Okay. Pushing buttons. Uh, we uh, want to thank you so much, Jose, for this great presentation. Thank it was you. really informative and also we're very grateful of how flexible you were when we had to cancel on you at the last minute. I mean, literally almost the last hour. And uh, we're so grateful that you came here tonight to share your expertise. And because we wanted to do something nice for you and show you how much we appreciate you, we bought you a tree in your honor that is going to be planted in a U.S. national forest. Very nice. And I have the coupon right here that proves that we actually did it. I'm going to try to <laughs> try to show it to you. You see it there? Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. And cool. uh, so it's a great nonprofit called Trees for a Change. And um, I'll have to get a mailing address from you at some point, and I'll pop this in the mail for you. But again, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. So that wraps up our uh, Q and A uh, via the chat. Um, if so, that's the that's the end of our presentation tonight. Um, if folks feel like sticking around a little bit, we might uh, have a little bit more ad hoc chat chatting. Although, if there's 50 people in the room, we'll have to be very careful not to step on each other's toes. Um, but if you'd like to stick around, maybe we'll have a little bit more conversation with microphones. Um, so thank you again, everyone for coming and we'll see you ne at next month's event. We'll be sending out some email with, uh, the link for the symposium that, uh, Dr. Tori Bueno mentioned earlier that he'd like us to, uh, pay attention to because there's a lot of good information going on. It's a full day on June the 5th. Yeah. Thank you. And I would like to all come. the very, the incredibly high volume many faces of Marion for showing up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this might be a good time for you to mention a little bit about the symposium. We didn't talk too much about it, but can you give us a little bit of flavor um, of what, what's involved? 
the symposium will have it. The intent is to be an education. You know, I, I said that it's a given that you have to have CCAs in San, San Diego now. So we're sort of shifting from advocating why you should have a CCA to how to have a CCA. We're bringing in um, speakers from established CCAs and experts, and they're going to be addressing these things like how a CCA can have local programs especially around um, distributed energy and batteries and microgrids, but also things about the technical details about organizing a CCA um, and the regulatory environment and things like that. So the intended audience is um, everybody from the, the professionals who are running the CCA and especially the, it's the nature of CCAs, the board of a CCA is composed of elected officials from the cities that form the CCA. So the people that are sort of, you know, ultimately in charge of a CCA um, aren't necessarily that technically sophisticated. So we're aiming to educate them about what's possible. Um, and the other audience is, is people like yourself, is, is interested community members who want to, you know, understand the, the complexities of what's going on. And, and in, in my humble opinion, a, a big issue that we're facing now is the transition from, you know, at this point, everybody says, yes, yes, I'm in favor of green. I'm in favor of 100% renewable. But in the world that I deal with, where you deal with it, the technical people, you get a lot of this yes, but. It's like, oh, we're all in favor of 100% renewable energy, but the duck curve, we still have to have these fossil fuel plants. So it's, it's um, you sort of have to go beyond advocacy and, and understand enough of the technology to, to engage um, at the level of, um, of the, the technical issues, not just the policy issues. And so we're aiming to bring a lot more technical knowledge to the people in charge of the CCAs and to the community, you know, interested community members so when they hear this stuff about, oh, you know, we can't have 100% green energy because of RA, you know, they'll know what's going on and not just be snowed because somebody's supposed to be an expert. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope you can all come. Uh, it's, you know, the one upside of it being a virtual thing is that the room is effectively unlimited size. Um, obviously, we're not going to have everybody's microphone on. But uh, you can all listen, and um, you can all send questions via chat as we did today. <clears throat> and I will be the moderator of that. And it's being put on by our sister organization, the San Diego Energy District, which is the advocacy group that's been pushing for CCAs for years and years. So, and you can, I can send, I have sent you a, um, a, a PDF flyer, which you can distribute to your mailing list. You know, has all the details about the, the agenda and how to log in. So. Uh, Jose, do you have any uh, direct uh, advice for folks that are able to influence our two CCAs here? Like I said, we do have uh, one person on the call uh, who's part of an advisory committee, but I think um, we all know somebody in the area, either uh, the See Councilwoman from Carlsbad, Corey Schumacher, yeah. Um, yeah, who's, who's helping to chair the CEA. Mm -hmm. What 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 type, kind of advice can we be giving those folks uh, to really push them in the right direction early on? Uh, I you know I've talked to some of the people involved, and and generally the pushback I've gotten is, you know, you understand that these CCAs have been started with absolute minimum budget. The most successful CCA is the one in Los Angeles County that was started by the, the choice of the governments that founded it was to give it a very substantial budget from the get-go. And therefore, they were able to launch a bunch of sophisticated rates and sophisticated programs immediately. For whatever reason, the, the governments in San Diego County that formed these two CCAs chose to give them the absolute minimum dollars to get started. And so if you talk to them about programs, the answer you get is, we can't think about programs now. We can't think about programs that we've had a couple of years and we've accumulated a reserve fund and all, and then we'll start thinking about programs. 
I would argue that there are certain programs that don't actually require a cash outlay like optimally designed rates. And if they don't feel that they can afford it because the rate design is done by specialist consulting firms, then they should let groups like ours or yours go out and beat the bushes for, you know, somebody who's willing to put money in, um, you know, as a charity to hire specialist consultants to design rates. Because once you design the rate, it doesn't actually cost you anything to run it. So I'd like to see them do, you know, ask themselves what programs can be put in place that don't actually require a continuing outflow of cash. And can we go someplace to raise the money to implement those programs rather than just, you know, feel that we have to do nothing but the bare minimum for three or five years or something. Because the argument I'm making is that you know, this is the climate crisis. We, we believe that we have, you know, 10 years to make a big impact to prevent catastrophe. And if that's the case, then saying, well, you know, we really can't start these programs for three years and it's going to take, you know, years after that for them to have a big impact. <clears throat> that's the wrong answer. The answer should be, what can we do to get hold of money to get, you know, some programs started sooner rather than later? I really appreciated that slide where you mentioned that you don't want the CCAs to turn into uh, uh, investor-owned <laughs> utilities uh, part two, um, yeah. because that really is a problem that we've seen with some of the CCAs that they basically just get bogged down trying to uh, buy more uh, a higher mix of renewable energy, and then they're not doing much beyond that. So that's a problem. Right. Well, I, um, I is think that, is that CPA know, that you were making reference to when you mm -hmm. said uh, in LA? Is it is it uh, Clean Power Authority you're talking yes. about? Yes, yeah. Okay. They so we were should... founded with a significantly more money, and therefore they've had much more success launching programs. Is, it, is there a, a, a person that we would want to interface with up there? Um, I can look it up. I have, I have them all in my database. So remind me and I'll send you a, a name of the person. I'm okay. actually, I wanted to get somebody from them to talk, but they were too busy. So I uh, will not have a speaker from them. <laughs> I, I heard a presentation from them earlier today, actually, um, but it was from Allison, who's uh, one of their marketing folks. Oh, and she gave a very good presentation. Can you that send was, your um, information? Yeah, yeah um, I, I can probably share that out to our group because that was from uh, the Climate Action Campaign. Um, their, their rep out of uh, Orange County ah. uh, put that on today as a webinar. So Okay. Um, yeah, I, I actually reached out to the president, but he was too busy to speak on the 5th. But if they have somebody who's out in the community, um, I, I have a slot open that I'm trying to fill. And I specifically want to fill it from somebody from the established CCA. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll try, to, try to get that hookup. Who yeah. else has something that interesting they want that, that they got lit up by listening to this conversation? Anyone have something to contribute? This was super informative, and I, I have to be honest with you. This is a, a new passion of mine. I'm working with Sierra Club, and they've got me working on CCA stuff. So um, I was Very part good. of an environmental justice uh, forum for a few hours about a week ago, and one of the pleas there was that, you know, th please don't turn this into, you know, more of the same with, uh, you know, running these things like power companies. Let's try to really benefit the community. Well, I think there's a tension between the people, you know, the financial people and the activists. And if you, if you listen, you'll hear the financial people going, oh, we have to be conservative. You know, we, we can't do anything until we've, we've built up our reserves. And, and you see that reflected in the writing of their, their, you know, goal statement. They say, oh, we have all these things we want to do, but we're not going to do it until we've, you know, accumulated some money. But I, I would argue that there's things they can do that aren't going to require a lot of money and, and or that could be done with money that they could go look for somewhere else. And, you know, maybe we need to, you know, do that for them or something. Are there any cautionary tales, CCAs that have failed? Do you know that there is no CCA that's failed in California? You know, people keep saying uh, this was actually an argument before the, um, the county. Uh, Gaspar, you know, did this, oh, the governments can't run anything. We shouldn't have a CCA. It might fail. In point of fact, no CCA in California has failed. And I think that there may have been some very early CCAs in Illinois 
that were organized and in, in, um, poorly organized that, that did not succeed um, because of the opt out thing. But uh, actually, it has not happened. Despite, I mean, there's a very interesting question that's going to have to be solved legally. There's the concept of provider of last resort, which means that um, if a local utility fails, there has to be somebody else to cover them the, to provide electricity because it's, it's considered an essential thing. So um, you don't have to buy, if you're a big company, you don't have to buy electricity from SDG&E. You can buy it directly on the wholesale market yourself. But SDG&E is what's called the provider of last resort. So they're supposed to be capable of, you know, supplying anybody, even if the CCA were to go out of business. But what it means when they wrote that letter to the legislature is they're asking to get out of that. They're asking not to be a provider of electricity at all. That means there will be no provider of last resort in San Diego, but there actually there has to be. So either the state is going to have to create some agency to be the provider of last resort, or one or both of the CCAs is going to have to be established as the provider of last resort. We actually went to the County Water Authority and suggested that given that they're a big, um, you know, utility-like organization, uh, they could take on that role. And they basically said, no, we have our hands full of water. We can't think about electricity. But uh, if you think about LADWP, that's exactly what they are. They, um, you know, they own the wires and the, you know, the water and everything. So um, somehow, some way, somebody is going to have to be put in place as the provider of last resort for San Diego. So and so the CEA is much is a much smaller uh, number of consumers and therefore mm -hmm. smaller power group uh, right. than the San Diego. Right. Um, I, I believe, but we've still got a lot of cities that have to figure their JPA inclusion out. So there could be others that either join that or we build a third, right? Or fourth or fifth. Yeah. I mean, if San Diego, you know, San Diego's San Diego gas and electric has announced they want out, you have to assume that one way or another, they're going to get permission to leave because their business is going to be untenable once the city of San Diego takes over that part of the load. So, you know, there's going to be increasing pressure on any city that hasn't done it to either form their own CCA or join one of the JPAs. And there's already, a, you know, a certain amount of push me, pull you between the two. Um, you know, it was a big shock to everybody that Encinitas joined the city of San Diego, not the North County one. So they kind of overlap now. Um, and some of the uh, East County ones are expected to join the city of San Diego this year. And, you know, Santee, I think, decided, well, we'll wait a year and see what happens. Um, but the, and the really big one is the county. The county, oh, by the way, is one of those organizations that buys its electricity directly. It doesn't go through SDG&E. Uh, they left SDG&E years ago paid the PCA charges, presumably still are, um, but they will have to join the CCA. That is not, I mean, when I say that the county, I mean the county government, who's a big user of electricity, buys electricity in the private market. The county, as the representative of everybody who lives in an unincorporated location, is going to have to form or join a CCA. So either the county will have to form its own CCA or it will have to join one of the JPAs. And they- um, Tell folks you know, what a JPA is. Never heard a that JPA before. is called the Joint Power Authority. It's like the, um, the Port Authority, right? It's a creature of a multiple set of governments. Typically the governments get together, they form this organization. It has quasi-governmental authority. And typically the governing board is made up of elected representatives from the governments that formed it. So like the, um, the, the two CCAs in San Diego, their members are city council members from the cities that formed it. Each city council elected one of their members to be the representative on the board of the JPA that runs the CCA. And there's sometimes so, they're proportional in how much power each 
That's, each member. That was a big contentious thing. In some CCAs, the voting is proportional to the power consumption. But when people did the math in San Diego, the city of San Diego was like 55% of all the power consumption in the county. So when the city of San Diego announced, oh, we're gonna form a CCA, some of the other cities said, wait a minute, that means you're gonna have 55% of the votes. <laughs> so nobody is gonna get any say except the city of San Diego. So they said, well, we'll make it so we only have 49% of the vote, even though we have 55% of the power. But, um, and some cities said, oh, okay. But the, the three North County cities um, said, well, you know, that means that you plus any one of the small towns down in the South Bay gets to run the whole thing, so we won't join. Um, the North County group is equal votes regardless of the size of the city. And the, they tried to get the county to join, but the county said, well, wait a minute, you're saying we only get one vote and Solana Beach gets one vote. We won't go for that. So, so they couldn't agree on the distribution of, of voting rights. And that's actually the, the holdup in forming more CCAs at the moment. To that, um, Jose, could you maybe keep, bring us up to speed as to what's going on with some of the other cities in North County that are in the process of doing their feasibility studies? Well, the issue is this. Um, under the law, the, there's a calendar for forming a CCA. You have to do a feasibility study. You have to write these formation documents. You have to actually enter into the market and contract for future power and RA. Um, so it takes a certain amount of time. It's a year between the time you file your documents with the state and the time you can actually go operational. And I believe that there's only certain dates that you can do it. So the issue was that anybody who didn't do it by the end of last year has an automatic one year delay. Mm. So there was pressure on these various towns. Are you gonna join these forming JPAs or not? Right. And certain towns did and certain towns said no. Well, once they said no, they automatically are delayed a year. So now it's gonna come up, they're gonna do their feasibility studies or whatever, and they're gonna to have to either join one of the established ones and now the establishments are going to go, well, we're established, so we're going to, you know, we're going to negotiate harder about rights. Um, or, or maybe they're going to compete with each other for getting people to join them. We'll see. Um, but the, um, you know, the decision, I mean, this was the issue that came up in the vote in various city councils was, do it now or you necessarily wait a year. And they don't get that many turns of that because, at some point, SDG&E is going to get, you know, whatever legislation they're asking for, and SDG&E will drop out of the picture, and then either they'll have to form a CCA or whatever, you know, creature the state creates to be the buyer of the provider of last resort, you know, which may be some, you know, government agency whose rates are not at all attractive, is going to become the default. Mm. And, um, you know, they're not going to like that. So, you know, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen over the next year. I have a question from Marion. Um, she was asking about the local energy, effici energy efficiency programs that sdg e is funding. Um, I think she said will expire in the end of 2020. Will there be an obligation for CCAs to continue local programs, those energy efficiency incentive programs? I don't think there's an obligation because they're not under the same regulatory regime as the investor-owned utilities. Um, and those programs are funded by fees that are added to the investor-owned utilities charges. And I don't think the CCAs have access to that money. The CCAs have chosen to have programs of their own. And one of the advantages they have is since they're not regulated, They've been much more experimental in the programs they do, but I don't think they have any obligation, nor do they have access to that same pot of money. So we could see a very weird position where someone realizes they're going to replace their uh, hot water heater with one of those expensive, more expensive um, 
heat pump hot water heaters, which I fully endorse, but you know, you get a, you get a discount because SDG and E is going to flag you for a discount. And if the CCE doesn't offer that, you could get people switching back over to SDG and E just to get their discount. That's an interesting point. That's something that should be argued to the CCAs. It, it has been argued to the CCA. <laughs> that, that, that actually came up at the last CEA meeting. Um, so yeah. I'm glad people are paying attention to that. But um, it's true. Like we need to be able to match everything that um, we think SDG and E is doing under benevolence. But it was, there was never any benevolence about it. And let's no, be honest, state folks. Money. Yeah, when when uh, when the power company sends you some little flyer in your bill that asks you to save power, you have to remember they never really had any financial incentive to do that. So there was always somebody in the background that was coercing them to send those uh, yeah. you know policies about how you save power. They want to sell you power. So um, we hope that the CCEs can think a little differently and actually ask you to save power for the, for the sake of everyone, not just uh, to fulfill some requirement. Anybody else? I, I do. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to um, add that um, there's another um, CCA that's forming with the city of Escondido and San Marcos and Vista. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, yes. it was just started like late last year. And I think those cities have uh, pledged the uh, initial allocations for, you know, to perform. Each city has to deposit funds for, to fund the feasibility study, which mm -hmm. hasn't been completed yet. But that, you know, this is another, uh, you know, another forming uh, CCA that, you know, we hope that will be completed. Okay, so that they're thinking of forming a third CCA, not Correct. joining one of the existing ones. Correct. Interesting. Well, and that's going to be part of their feasibility study, I hope, is that they uh, explore the ideas of which JPA to join, or um, you may find that those three can't really come together. Um, or, or one of them decides to do it and the two others, you know, decide to balk for another year. So, um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of coordination between the governments in that way. Mm. Did you understand that there was, Patricia? You may be gone. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, uh, I've been out of the loop. There's another... Uh, lady uh, that is more involved with the, you know, parties that are directly involved with the uh, cities, you know, they're forming this. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you. And I don't want to give you a, a guess. So, um, but I'll try and get that information for you. Thank you. I was at the uh, Carlsbad Council meeting the night that they <clears throat> um, decided to go ahead and uh, um, you know, form the JPA. And um, a lot of talk was going around the room in regard to um, them building in provisions for other North County cities mm -hmm. to join and making it advantageous for them to do so, even in regard to splitting the costs or, or you know, um, equalizing the cost of the uh, feasibility studies. Are you familiar with with all of that, Jose? Yeah, I know that they tried to do various things. That they were hoping some of them would join this year. Um, they have left it open for further ones to join. Um, I think that, I think there's two, sort of two counter tendencies. One is to feel that, well, we form this thing and anybody who joins it is gonna pay more. Um, um, but the other tendency is, well, we're competing with the other CCA to get cities to join, so we have to offer them more attractive terms. One of the things the city of San Diego did was the city of San Diego ate all the upfront costs for all the other cities that joined it. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons they got a bunch of other cities to join them. Um, the, the three North County cities each put in, I think, an equal amount. And that was a little bit debatable because they're not all the same size. 
Um, and I think they do have some provision that um, if somebody else joins and there's some economy of scale of the uh, startup costs, that they'll um, recompute how the startup costs work, which means that as more cities join, everybody will come out ahead. But I don't, I don't know the exact formula they agreed to for that. It'd be interesting to hear about those economies of scale because I know uh, one of the members of the um, my generation group of, at a Sierra Club uh, said that they had spoken to the consultant in Oceanside who was trained to do their feasibility study, um, and he insisted that there's really no advantages to to scale. And I thought that seemed preposterous given how scared these city governments are to be able to take on this authority of running these power companies. It seems like the shared responsibility in itself is a, is a helpful effort. Um, I've heard other people say that there's um, maybe a sweet spot that Solana Beach formed a CCA knowing that it was very small to have a CCA and that they'd have a, a high ratio of overhead costs. In fact, one of the reasons, one of the ways they did that is they have no staff whatsoever. The city manager of Solana Beach is also the manager of the CCA and they contracted everything. So they have zero staff. Um, but that meant that they couldn't launch any programs at all. If you look at the, the Cal CCA table, because they have a table of what programs every CCA has done. Um, Solana Beach is like, oh dear, we have zeros in every row of this table. Um, because they, you know, they're very small for a CCA and they, they kind of knew they would be winding up joining other ones. Um, the, you know, city of San Diego is gonna be with one of the biggest CCAs ever formed. Um, some people argue that a big CCA can't be as flexible and fast moving and that there's some sweet spot in the middle that, that the, you know, the multi, if the cities in North County got together, they'd be the ideal size. Um, Certainly, it's, it's, it's difficult if you're too small. And a lot of this revolves around this business about buying power. Um, Solana Beach contracted the buying of power to a, a business that does this for CCAs, but it means they have absolutely no say over it. So when somebody I know went to the city of Solana Beach and said, I want to build a local power plant, you know, contract with me, they said, well, we can't do it. You have to go to this company that does all the buying. And their answer was, oh, we won't even look at you unless you're building a, you know, 500 megawatt plant out in the desert. So they couldn't have any local power generation because they'd given up all control over that. So, um, you know, you have to be big enough to, to be able to, to have at least some in-house expertise and some you know, financial clout if you're gonna actually have local programs. If all you're gonna do is just buy electricity and sell it, then I guess theoretically you could just you know, be, be nothing but a, an office and, and subcontract everything to somebody who's, whose only mission is buy electricity at the lowest possible price regardless of how green it is. But if you're actually trying to have programs, I think you have to have a certain size. You know, it seems like um, we're missing an area of revenue with regard to transportation, quite a transition of large uh, semis, electric buses, I think. LA is purchasing 4,000 electric buses. Mm -hmm. and, um, and those buses will be traveling, you know, most likely to San Diego and various places. But that seems like a revenue source. Is there, a, it seems as though, stg &E is putting in the majority of those EV stations and it seems as though CCAs could utilize those as a revenue source to bring down the bill. For um, some of the CCAs have been very active in putting in charging stations. Um, it's Again, it's something that the local CCAs have as an aspirational thing, but at the rate they're going, it's going to be years. Um, the, the whole charging thing is very interesting because it's very, very time dependent. Um, and the, the 
trend, the, let me think how to say, the transmission requirements into a charging station can be very high if all the charging is being done in one location. Because if they're all running, at, if they're all charging at once, it's an enormous instantaneous load. And now you get into the thing, if you're being dinged for the demand charge, the demand charge becomes the major cost of the charging. So you're actually better off distributing the charging. And there actually some been some studies about, does a charging station want to have a battery so that when the vehicles are being charged, they're not being charged over the grid, they're being charged from the local battery. So there's, there's a lot of, of uh, calculation of thought going into, you know, as we get to the world where transportation is substantially electrified, how are we going to distribute that electricity? And how are we going to do that with hopefully not having to do a lot of investment in grid infrastructure? Billions of dollars are being put into blue energy, hydrogen. And a lot of companies, Amazon and others, are investing. Uh, I think Cummings Engine and whatnot, or they're investing a lot of money in hydrogen um, and in stations that provide, you know, base loads for loading up with hydrogen. Um, um, any uh, okay. on the horizon? Any effort for CCA? Um, not. I don't know of any CCA who's got into the hydrogen business. Um, early on, there was a lot of controversy about whether um, hydrogen fuel cells would be competitive with batteries, and it appears that that is not going to be the case for personal vehicles. You know, cars. On the other hand, it's looking like heavy duty vehicles might be powered by hydrogen. Um, partly because it greatly reduces the amount of hydrogen transmission that you have to do if you're only serving a fleet of, of you know, fleet vehicles. Um, and also because it, at that level, it's much easier to fuel vehicles with hydrogen than to have the, the very heavy wiring that you have to go to power a fleet in one garage. Um, the other thing about hydrogen is that there's um, there are certain industrial processes where you actually need the the hot gas, and so you can't replace them with electricity. And hydrogen is the candidate for that. Um, but part of the hydrogen thing is political, and a part of the natural gas companies. They're trying to make the argument, well, we'll generate hydrogen from solar electricity and we'll mix it in with our natural gas. So all of now it's green gas and we should be allowed to continue to distribute gas and stop this electrification business. So there's a certain amount of, of competition between, you know, a hydrogen economy and an electrified economy. And my personal thinking is that Hydrogen is going to wind up as a more specialized thing for industrial applications and heavy vehicles. It's not going to become that the uh, existing natural gas infrastructure is just used to distribute green hydrogen. For one thing, hydrogen is incompatible with most metals. So I don't think that we could distribute hydrogen through the existing infrastructure. There's, I don't know if you know the term hydrogen embrittlement, but um, nuclear reactors have to be built out of special metal because the hydrogen in them um, gets into the metal. It actually diffuses into metals and makes them brittle. So metals that are used to transport hydrogen will fracture if they're not made of special alloys that don't permit the diffusion of hydrogen. I can't see just putting hydrogen into the existing natural gas infrastructure. Jose, I had a question for you. Um, this is... Uh... Regarding electric vehicle charging, have you seen any, uh, whether it's CCAs or IOUs, um, come up with a strategy where they uh, can create or install EV chargers that, that basically charge back to your own personal electric account? Because you talked earlier about how, in theory, what should be happening is folks that do drive electric cars to a job should be plugging in at work and charging with our uh, excess of solar PV power that we have. Um, but it makes for an awful model if you're talking about them having to pay their company or pay some service to charge at work. 
I don't know if anybody has worked on that, but it could be. Um, an interesting thing would be to integrate that with parking. Um, there's some studies, um, I forgot the guy's name, but he's a local guy who's been working on the issue of, you know, free parking is in some sense an economic distortion, a tremendous economic distortion. Um, and if you were gonna do that, you could integrate charging and parking um, and have a more, you know, um, I forget what the economic, the economist's term for it is when you appropriately charge people according to the cost of what they're consuming. Um, but the, I've never heard of a system where it automatically went to your electric bill, although you could imagine such a system. Biosat uh, does that for their employees. They have about eight different chargers and they're increasing them in their parking facilities. Who is that? Viasat here in Carlsbad. Do they charge for them? No. Some companies are making it free now, but they're imagining that at some point they'll start charging. It's one of their company benefits mm -hmm. to encourage electric vehicles. Well, we should probably wrap up, folks. It's eight o'clock. Um, you know, the library is going to close soon, and we've got to. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this has been a wonderful talk, and uh, we would definitely will uh, get this recording out there because um, a lot of really valuable information here and stuff that I think uh, we need the people that are run the CCAs to watch this video um, and to hear un understand not just. Uh, what you've covered here, but that there's resources here in our county that can help guide them to to do the right thing from the get-go rather than wait a few years and then finally get around to improving their programs. Hopefully we'll have a link to the recording on the uh, North County Climate Change Alliance yeah. Facebook page over the next several days. Good. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, All thank right. you so much, Jose. We really appreciate it and it's it has been immensely um educational do appreciate thank you it. and i hope to see other folks at the symposium i i've gotten permission yeah. to be there for my work so i'll definitely be there <laughs> and learning about it and i hope some of you can join us there too that's on june the 5th okay thank you yeah i hope you can all come so. all right any other uh statements before i shut us all down Thank well, we can all take off pause and thank Jose and say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. Thanks for the tree. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.